you mentioned being Catholic. I myself was born into a Catholic family. I've been to mass. I understand very surface level what it means to be Catholic. I was also bar mitzvahed as a kid. I was raised Jewish and Catholic. It was very interesting. But being both of those, I didn't pick, nothing stuck, nothing stuck. And then in my 20s, I was probably a super cringy military atheist. Thank God I've grown out of that. And today I'm noticing that every part of my life is a 12 out of 10, but there's still something missing, something tying it all together. I think someone described it as a God-shaped hole. And I have been looking, I've been looking, I've been searching, I've been exploring, I've been really open to tradition, open to a notion of God. In fact, just today and yesterday, I've been reading about uh, St. Thomas, and I've been reading about these connections between Aristotle and God and the way he translated that for everyone and how powerful that was. And I wanted to ask you about your Catholicism and your religion and your spirituality. How does that affect your day-to-day -day activity? What, what energy does that give you? How does it help you? What is that meaning like in your life, Jack? Because I, I want that. That's one reason why I decided to ask my long-term girlfriend to get married. We want to invite God into our relationship and commit to something bigger. And so I think I'm taking baby steps, uh, if you could call marriage a baby step. Uh, but uh, just can you just talk to me a little bit about your 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 spirituality, how it how it works with you in your life today, and what what role do you see for it in America? I'm talking to Sorab Amari next week, so I know where he comes down. Great guy. Great I know guy. where he comes down on this, but tell me just a little bit about your personal experience and, and how does it work for you and what do you see for it uh, as, an, as our nation as it relates to tradition well, yeah. and spirituality as such? You know, this is something that the founders talked about in the sense that our constitution doesn't work without a moral backbone right without a moral fiber of the nation and you largely had that at the time of the founding um you you spiritually speaking sure there are there are various groups of as now as a catholic i would say there's various groups of protestants out there but um you know there was religious pluralism but it was generally christian right it was a generally christian founding uh, largely protestant and so at the time, um, the the morals, yes, there's differences of doctrine in terms of um, the various Protestant groups, but in terms of the, at least at that time, the moral underpinnings of it, this was this was all straight. Now this that that has been clearly corrupted, not only in terms of Protestantism, but also in terms of many of the Catholic um, Catholic churches, Catholic parishes. Um, Catholic institutions, and so you you do see these splits. You see a con there's sort of a conservative church, and there's some there's certain rites and certain groups of of priests and parishes that are that ascribe to this more conservative doctrinaire version, right, of the writings and of the teachings and of the traditions. And then you see this other church, and you see this in, in progressive Christianity, most pronounced, but. Um, just wants to go with the times that wants to take on whatever worldly um, hot button issues that there are and always be kind of pushing those and jumping ahead, jumping forward. And, you know, there's this, there's this thing where I actually was in uh, down in Miami and we went to this church It's called Yezu church, which is the oldest church in Miami. It's built late 1800s. And uh, Miami's not actually not that old of a city. Um, it was it was mostly just like swamps and marshes until about the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. But this church is there, and there's a Cuban priest speaking. He said, "You know, you can't go to these churches that only talk about the mercy of God and the love of God, right? He is merciful, and he is loving, but you cannot escape the judgment of God and the judgment aspect. And one thing that we teach in Catholicism." that to call out sin to admonish the sinner right is an act of spiritual mercy right it's an act of spiritual mercy to admonish the sinner this is when people say oh well, the you know the church wants to punish biden by denying him communion right this is the big uh issue with the catholic church right now i say no you don't get it it is an act of mercy because he is living in a public break or what we would call a schism right he is schismatic with church doctrine he is publicly denying the doctrine of the church and then potentially being a role model for others to deny that teaching as well and because of that public schism with church teaching that is the reason for the public 
admonishment as an act of mercy because we pray for him to return to that tradition. And so uh, when Thomas talks about this, he says that our theology and our faith give us not only foundation in life, but also purpose. So Thomas writes that life is kind of like, it's sort of like a boomerang, right? We, we start with God, then we're thrown out into the world all on our own by ourselves. And that life's journey is a journey of returning to God. But then the interesting question is, well, how do we do that, right? Does that just mean going to church? Does that mean you know, become a monk and you, and you do all the time? What Thomas says, and he's, he's drawing from Aristotle on this because Aristotle was doing what? He was studying the human condition, right? And this is something that definitely concerns theologians as well as philosophers, that in the human condition, you have the situation of, yes, we are prone to, prone to sin, man has fallen, right? We are prone to uh, base desires, primal desires, but we also have talents and skills and abilities. And so, and Aristotle, of course, goes at length and Plato builds on this later talking about uh, what, where should people put those and how should people categorize themselves, et cetera. But what Thomas talks about is he takes a step further and says, those talents are a form of potentiality that God has given us when we're born, right? So you're first born, you have that potentiality and that what God wants you to do, and Jesus talks about this in the parable of the talents, he wants you to use those talents, grow them to their fullest fullest actualization. And so as you grow as a person, as you become fully formed and fully realized and fully actualized as a person, if you are doing that in a true moral sense while walking on that moral path, you are actually following the path back towards God that he's laid out for you. That's Thomas Aquinas. I like that, Jack. Thank you for giving me that bit. I'm reading so Rab's book right now. Is God Reasonable was the most recent chapter that I read, using reasoning <laughs> to get back to God. Uh, there was a part of me that always thought that uh, you couldn't have reason and God at the same time. I'm actually learning that's quite different. And uh, I appreciate your conversation, your steadfastness and your publicness with your faith. It's inspirational. It's leadership. I appreciate it. I get the feeling it's it's something that we I all need. I could go up against some of this stuff without, you know, without, you know, I go to church every week and because we've, we've, we kind of church shopped a little bit. We found a great parish, a good traditional parish. And I, I feel energized when I go to church. It doesn't feel like a, uh, like a commitment or it doesn't feel like an obligation. I go in there and say, oh, thank God. Thank God I'm, I'm with the body of Christ. Thank God I'm with people who, you know, who look at this, that know how sinful modern life is and, and the world is and know that we are, you know, they say, what's, what's the holiest part of mass? And it's the end, right? It's actually the very end, right? Cer certainly we have the, the Eucharist, but the part of mass where they says, go forth and spread the good news. You are given a mission, right? That's not one hour where you go in there and you say, oh, this is nice. And here's, you know, this little sacrifice and that's good. And God's great. He's awesome. Look at these paintings. Wow, that's great. He did that for us. No, 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 no. You're getting your marching orders, right? And I say that as a, a former military guy, but you're getting your marching orders to go out there, spread this news, be that beacon of morality and hope and truth in the world because the world's always going to be the way the world is right that's that's the way it is you're not, you're not going to change that no matter no matter how much the progressives and the postmodernists and um you know they're they're i always try to say they they're um you know they're just atheists trying to run away from nihilism um because they don't know how to how to uh you know how to balance the two or how to um you know, make it compatible they can't they can't agree uh, on it so um, I said, no, that, that God-shaped hole will always be there until you realize what's really going on behind the scenes.